right, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, let's take a look at the motor build before we look at the final product. So we blew the motor up. Uh, we figured out what the culprit was. We did the teardown and we've decided the direction that we're going to take with the rebuild. If you missed those three videos, the link for them is in the description. So now we're ready to build. So in this video, we'll assemble the infamous nine liter billet stroker from start to finish. So there'll be a lots of exciting engine porn in this video. So let's start out with the engine block. So my original factory Gen 5 block uh, had some damage. It had damage in one of the lifter bores where the lifter grenaded and the debris was circulated and tore up some of the journals for the camshaft. So that was sent off to the machine shop. It was cleaned up and sent back. So looking over some of the measurements when, when the block came back, uh, there was some gouging in one of the bores. Uh, it was not in the area of piston travel, so it wasn't much of a big deal, but it's something that I didn't like. Um, I wasn't particularly pleased with how the repairs on the uh, lifter bore came out either. So, you know, I decided that it's just best that I don't gamble uh, an engine build this expensive on on a used block that that maybe in my opinion in my uneducated opinion has some questionable repairs so i decided to, to get a brand new block now big thanks to my friend andy who supplied this engine block to me and this is actually a gen 4 block so for those that don't know the gen 4 and gen 5 blocks are dimensionally identical but the gen 4 blocks were still using the original oem supplier whereas the gen 5 uh, was using a new supplier and there were some process changes uh, with the block castings that created some debris issues which is why some of the uh, some of the vehicles have that R28 recall in the early VIN stages. My car is actually one of those R28 recall cars. So from a desirability standpoint in my opinion the Gen 4 blocks are actually if you can get a Gen 4 new block they're much much more desirable than a Gen 5 block because you don't have to worry uh, is there, you know, a loose piece of uh, casting sand somewhere in a, you know, in the oil galley that's going to break off in 300 miles after you, you know, finish your engine build and uh, circulate through and, and wipe one of your bearings out. So once the new block was in hand, I had to make a decision on what I was going to do for the bottom end build. I had two options. I could either go back to a, you know, an OEM rotating assembly at stock displacement, or I can do the nine liter build. So I figured I'd get quotes to do both. And depending on how much it was to rebuild back to stock and how much it was uh, to nine liter, I could weigh the two options and decide what was best for me. So the quotes came back and you know the spread between the two just did not make sense financially to rebuild back to stock. And add to it, you know, the kind of the opportunity cost of going back in some years down the road to do the nine liter anyways, it just didn't make sense not to upgrade at this point. Additionally, this turns a negative situation into a positive one. And instead of just having a lighter wallet by virtue of rebuilding the car back to where it was and, and not having really anything to look forward to here, you at least get to look forward to some more power. So with the decision made, we packaged the new block up at Viper Exchange. We packaged up all of the components that could be salvaged, uh, the complete top end, and we sent everything off to Prefix in Detroit. So it took a few days for everything to arrive in Detroit, but everything arrived in one piece and the build was started. I'd been dealing with Scott Rickard over at Prefix um, in, in regards to quotation and, and some of the technical questions that I've had. And to be honest, uh, I was extremely pleased to have somebody that's, that's kind of been in the game for a long time that knows his stuff in regards to motors because nothing kind of irritates me more than, than dealing with people whom uh, kind of function as a proxy, right? I have a lot of technical questions. Uh, I'm naturally curious, especially when I'm spending this kind of money, obviously. So, you know, it was great to deal with someone whom I could ask those technical questions to, and he could provide me uh, responses very quickly and kind of put my mind at ease. So that was a great thing. Work began on everything as soon as all of my parts touched ground, which was great news. Started off with the brand new Gen 4 block, then you have your Mali Forge Pistons, Cali's Ultra H-Beam Rods. New rods and pistons are just absolutely beautifully machined, beautifully finished, uh, really beefy stuff. Uh, this can handle <laughs> a lot, a lot more power than what the car is going to be making. 
Then you have Comp's Custom Ground Extreme Cam, which looks absolutely beautiful with that micro polishing on all the lobes and that Calico CT1 journal coating. Uh, to the right of that, you can see that modified crank scraper and a uh, brand new timing cover. So my old timing cover couldn't be reused. We had a lot of damage in the oil rotor housing area and we just decided not to attempt a weld repair. So we just bought a brand new uh, front cover. We're moving on to the stroker crank, kind of the piece de resistance here. So this is Cali's stroker crank, uh, 4.2 inch stroke, so about a quarter inch up on the factory. I think it's a 3960. Uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, crankshaft. It's been nitrided, micro polished, and most importantly, it is not cross drilled between the uh, mains and the rod journals. So uh, you have no rod bearing oiling issues, which is why uh, these nine liter packages makes make a lot of sense for cars that are road raced. You can see here that the crank is being balanced. And as soon as that was finished, they moved on to the block machining, which is all done in house. So the block, uh, a couple of things are being done to it. Uh, there's some, some machining work for improved oiling, like cutting this oil groove uh, eyebrow in the, in the cam bore. Uh, then you have the camshaft and the crankshaft bores are line honed. Then the cylinder bores are torque plated and honed. Uh, make sure you, when you guys build a motor that uh, you guys for sure get the engine block torque plated. If you don't know what that is, Google it uh, or ask your engine builder. And if your engine builder doesn't know what that is, then definitely find a new engine builder. Meanwhile, while the block was getting finished up, the top end was getting worked on. So the cylinder heads, my old cylinder heads were disassembled. Everything was soda blasted, uh, which looks, I, I love it when components get cleaned up and they just have this like beautiful machined look to them. Uh, the valves were lapped and ground, new seals were installed, retainers, uh, brand new springs were installed. Each of the springs was individually verified before the installation for things like seat pressure, open height, bind height, you know, spring rate, all of the good stuff. All of this was reassembled, put together, and you had a finished, two finished cylinder heads ready to go back onto the car. Finishing up the bottom end, we had the main bearings installed into the block. We had the pistons built up with the rings, rods and caps were installed, the crank was installed. Also, the entire rotating assembly was meticulously blueprinted and everything was torqued to spec. Uh, last but not least, we had the camshaft and the timing components going on. Uh, new oil rotors installed, the front cover and the filter went on. And at this point, they were ready for the valve train for the Cometic head gaskets and the top end to be put back on the motor. So speaking on the valve train, um, I am once bit, twice shy in that department, or in my case, twice bit, thrice shy. Uh, for the new setup, most of the 9 liter builds that Prefix does usually go with the Delphi hydraulics with the ceramic metering ball. This is pictured uh, on the left. And this is the lifter that's used in the TA2 LS Trans Am series race engines, and it's been proven very reliable. But there is one step further, and, and, and I decided it was worth the upgrade, uh, mostly because I don't ever want to have uh, a lifter grenade my entire motor again. So this is the lifter on the right. It's the Comp Short Travel Link Bar Style Race Roller. And these are supposed to be the highest stability, highest revving roller hydraulics that you can buy. So you can take a look at the section area above the bushing in both of these lifters, and you can see how that area could definitely be a stress concentrator, and that's actually exactly where my overload failure occurred if you look at this picture of my failed lifter. In regards to the rocker arms, you can see the difference in construction between the intake valve and the exhaust valve side rockers on the Gen 5. So the closed end style with that drawn cup on the exhaust side and the open roller design, which just sits on the intake sides. So the exhaust sides are the only ones that people really have experienced failing, myself included. Uh, what usually happens is the trunnion cap cracks and it spills the bearings into the motor. So I was told because of the valve train geometry, there's some eccentric loading going on on the exhaust side rocker. So they're more prone to failure. You can notice this in the assembled picks 
which will follow. Looking at the rocker arm from above, you can see that the rocker tip is actually slightly off center from the center line. But the intake side, it loads squarely and they never seem to have any issues. For, the, for this new build, we went with the CHE bushing upgrade on the exhaust side, which just eliminates the needle bearings altogether in that failure mode. And we left the intake side completely alone, uh, even though they were all disassembled, inspected, and cleaned. So only a couple of days after my bear block arrived, we had something that looked uh, to be like a real motor. Uh, the valve train was in, the lash and preloader set, and there were just a couple of small bits away from completion. Uh, we ended up throwing a new water pump on because my old one was kind of uh, weeping slightly uh, when we were disassembling it. And in this picture right here, you can clearly see uh, the trunnion upgrades uh, from CHE on the exhaust rockers. So at this point, we really just had the intake manifold and a couple of other little bits left and we were gonna be done. Exactly one week after my parts got there, I was greeted with this beautiful sight, 550 cubic inches of pure badassery. My nine liter was completely built. It was done. It was ready for uh, its first fire on the engine dyno and to go through the break in procedures. Uh, I was blown away by, by how fast everything was put together over there. I mean, these guys must have this stuff down to a science. So very, very impressed with Prefix. The completed motor made its way into the dyno room the following week. Uh, it usually spends about an hour or so on braking oil going through this kind of computer controlled varied RPM and, and load scenario to set the rings and, and make sure everything is running properly. Then they do uh, some back to back power pulls to make sure it's making the power that's advertised. Uh, this package is rated for around 825 crank uh, horse and around 750 pound-feet of torque. So once the motor, and you'll, you'll see the video coming up next, once the motor went on the dyno, uh, it got broken in, run in, made the power. They pull it off of the dyno. They do a compression and a loop down test. And once the motor passes that, the fluids get drained. Then the motor gets created and shipped back for install. So my motor made uh, just a touch over 800 and around 740 foot pounds, which was exactly in line with, with the expectations. Um, I absolutely love the new curve and, and how the car is making, you know, 600 to 750 foot pounds of torque from 3,500 RPM all the way to fuel cut. So this thing should, should be a thing of beauty on the street. Um, like I'm not a big dyno numbers guy. I, I genuinely don't care. I know this is what usually sells people, especially people that don't really have a fundamental understanding of, um, you know, motors and, and, and racing. They just kind of look at the dyno sheets that, you know, that shops put in front of their face and they get excited because they can tell their neighbor or somebody down the street about them. Um, my car has always dynoed low you know, much to the dismay of all the dyno racers worldwide. And yet it's always run its ass off, as you can see by the videos that I post, right? So, you know, I think it's prudent to view, you know, dyno as a tuning tool and to gauge the delta and, and nothing more, right? People go crazy comparing, you know, absolutes across all these different dynos to different correction factors, which they have no idea what they mean. Uh, different calibrations, you know, and of course they always cherry pick the highest number they've ever seen versus the lowest number they've ever seen, right? It's just, it's an exercise in futility. So take these numbers with a grain of salt. Um, you know, the prefix told me that the motors with some miles on them uh, can dyno around, you know, 30 horse more than this. 
So they said to expect around a two to 3% increase in power after the motor loosens up a bit with some mileage. But, you know, once the motor gets installed, uh, and I get some miles on it, I will put it on the chassis dyno, the same chassis dyno that I've had the car uh, on when it was stock, when it was full bolt on, when it had just heads cam, and now with the nine liter. So we'll be able to overlay all four of those curves together and kind of see how the curve moves uh, with kind of each stage of upgrades. I think that would be really cool to see. All right, guys, now that's about it. And if you've made it this far through all my rambling, I appreciate the patronage and join me in the next video, part five, where we drop the motor into the car, do the first fire and go for our first drive. Thanks for watching.